But there is something I want to tell you about for the Benton County Republican Party. On March 19th, we're having our Lincoln Day dinner. And uh, our guest speaker is going to be Michael Medved. Uh, yeah. So if you guys want to come and hear Michael Medved, um, I would be, I'd be glad to, to get you the information about that. And uh, we'd love to have you at our, our dinner. There will be some information on the Benton County website, which is bentoncountygop.com. Um, the location is going to be at the convention center on March 19th. And so I believe the cost for the tickets are $75 a piece. So I'm glad to hear that, you know, let's give three cheers for Michael Medved and hopefully we'll see you at our Lincoln dinner, March 19th. Hi, I'm Lisa Benegas. I'm the vice chair for the um, Benton County Republicans. I'm also the chair for the Lincoln Day uh, dinner. The, there was a slight error in the venue. The venue is the Shiloh Inn at Richland. I'm sorry. At 70 Comstock Street, for those who really want to know the big details. The big thing that the state party has done this year than they've ever done in any other caucus and convention time is they're trying to get young children who are really excited about the political process to be involved. So if you have a, uh, how, did, how, does, how did they put it? If you have a child that would like to page at both the caucus or at, because we have so many pooled caucus sites, we need lots of little uh, runners to make sure people are finding the right precincts to sit down and, and talk about the straw poll, about the party platform. Um, so if you have a child between the ages of 14 and, since now we sometimes graduate a little bit later than 18, but as long as you haven't got that high school diploma yet, there is some paperwork that you have filled out by the caucus chair and the county chair. And if your child will, will page at the caucus and at the convention, then they get their name sent in and they can also page, they win the honor of paging at the state convention. And then after they've paged there, if they're interested in going further, they can page at the national convention. So if you are interested in knowing about the program, please contact your party officers, they all know about it. So that's your, you know, Greg Beeler knows it in Franklin County, Curtis Moore knows it, he's your, your Franklin County chair. Brandy Didier is your vice chair, she knows about all this stuff. And Brenda High is the Franklin County committee woman. In Benton County, that would be myself, it would be Patrick, it would be Tony, and by Thursday we'll know who our committee woman is. Um, so these are the things that that are going on. We want youth to get involved. So please come and see us and we're ready to go. Introduce Daryl Johnson. He is a pastor of the Faith Assembly Church in Pasco. He has a personal connection to the state chair for the Washington State Newt Gingrich campaign. So anyone, please give a warm welcome to Pastor Daryl Johnson. Come on out, Daryl. Thank you, and thank you for being here today for this great event in the Tri-Cities. It's my privilege to introduce the Gingriches, and Callista Gingrich is the president of Gingrich Productions, a multimedia production company based out of Washington, D.C. Her and her husband, Newt, host and produce historical and public policy documentaries. She also has a, 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 loves music and photography. It's been published in the New York Times as well as the Washington Post. She's written a New York Times bestseller, children's book, titled Sweet Land of Liberty. Would you give a Tri-Cities welcome to Callista Gingrich? great to be in Tri-Cities this morning, thanks. We are so proud of the many volunteers who have been working diligently on this campaign throughout the Tri-Cities and the state of Washington. Thank you for your support. Newt and I are engaged in this race because we believe America is at a crossroads and care deeply about the future of this country. There are only a few months left before the most important election in our lifetime. Our only opponent is Barack Obama, and we are committed to removing him from the White House. Yeah. 
Newt is the only candidate with the experience and knowledge necessary to rebuild the America we love. Yeah. Yeah. He has a successful national record of creating jobs, balancing the budget, and reforming the government. Today, we need a leader who can clearly articulate why President Obama and his policies are wrong for America. We need a leader who understands that we must contain and defeat our enemies. And we need a leader with bold solutions to create a better future for all Americans. I believe that leader is my husband. Please welcome former Speaker of the House and the next President of the United States, Newt Gingrich. Let me say, first of all, thank you. I think uh, that may be as enthusiastic a welcome as Clista's has ever gotten for... Uh, <laughs> we're both we're, we're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled you all would come out today. Uh, we are actually, it's, it's interesting, you know, the president is giving a speech on energy, I think, uh, in Florida at about literally this moment. Uh, and, and I'll give you three easy steps the president could announce today. And when you see the evening news, you can decide whether... Uh, he got any of them right. Because <laughs> the president, of course, is going to talk about energy. And the reason he's going to talk about energy is that the price of gasoline is going up, and his campaign advisors have suggested to him that he should look like he's concerned. <laughs> now, this is a president who appointed as Secretary of Energy Dr. Chu, who had said in the summer of 2008 his real goal was for Americans to pay the same price as Europeans, which is nine or ten dollars a gallon. Uh, this is the same president who himself has said he knows prices have to go up, he just hopes the shock isn't too great. So now all of a sudden he wants to run for re-election, so he'd like us to believe that he's not actually Barack Obama, that he actually was always in favor of energy, and that he now is going to tell us how much he's done. He also has the gall to tell us that production is up, which it is, but the reason it's up is because North Dakota was on private land and the government couldn't stop it. So, so, so let's, let's, start with, let's start with clarity here, all right? This is a radical left-wing administration which is against developing energy in the United States and which is actively engaged in appeasing our enemies in the Middle East. And it is a dangerous administration for our future, both economically and in national security terms. Now, so there are three things that the president could do immediately. First, he could today announce that he's changed his mind and he is approving the Keystone Pipeline. That would immediately bring oil to Houston from Canada, and it would mean the Canadians would not have to have a partnership with China. And I am committed, when I become president, to signing on the very first day an executive order authorizing the Keystone Pipeline. The second thing the president could do is drop all of his absolutely unnecessary red tape in the Gulf and allow people in the Gulf of Mexico to go back producing energy. That would lead to 400,000 barrels of oil a day of American oil, and that would be a tremendous help in offsetting the Middle East. Right. Yeah. Right. We had a, a petition drive in uh, 2008 uh, called Drill Here, Drill Now, Pay Less and a million six hundred thousand people signed up uh, and it only uh, became drill baby drill and I think the American people as they look at gasoline rising and rising and rising are going to realize that what we need to do is change in a dramatic way. Now I have a proposal, the third thing you could do is you could open up federal land and you could open up offshore and we could rapidly develop things. Here, here's what the left does not want us to know. We have more total energy in the United States than any other country in the world. That's right. We have a government which is anti-American energy. 
So they are blocking us from developing ourselves. And if you look at the way the federal government manages public land, it has increasingly managed public land on behalf of a handful of environmental extremists in San Francisco and against the economic interest of 95% of the American people. And so we need a fundamental change in how we approach this. Uh, I have a speech, if you go to newt.org, just my first name.org, I have a speech I did recently uh, that's about 30 minutes long that walks step by step through what we could do for energy in the United States. And it has two basic goals. The first is that we ought to become energy independent so that no American president ever again bows to a Saudi king. The second is that we should become energy independent so we can bring down the price of gasoline with a goal of $2.50 a gallon so that people are in a position that they can afford to drive their car or they can afford to drive their truck. Now, this seems like, you know, a number that the left will say and the elite will say, oh, you can't get there. Well, when I was speaker for four years, the average price was $1.13. When Obama was sworn in, the average price was $1.89. So trying to get to somewhere between $2 and $2.50 is closer to the historic norm. It's, think of it as the pre-Obama norm. <laughs> it's not something that's wild. It's not something that's fancy. And at 2 or 2 50 you begin to generate enough profits that you'll get plenty of exploration, plenty of development, uh, because people will be making enough profit that, it will be, that there will be no question that you will have a tremendous explosion of new development all across the country. Now... When you do that, when you do that, two really good things happen. First, you keep $500 billion here at home. That creates millions of new jobs here in the United States. And frankly, if you keep down the price of energy, that improves the standard of living across the whole country. It lowers the cost, for example, of, de of delivering food to your local grocery store. It makes it dramatically better for all of us. The second thing that happens, though, is by opening up federal land and by opening up offshore, the federal government gets royalties. And the estimate by one of the people who developed North Dakota was that the amount of royalties we could get from federal land and offshore could be as high as $16 trillion to $18 trillion over the next generation. That's enough money that if you put that to one side and didn't spend it, it would pay off, it would pay off the national debt. So imagine an American energy policy that said our goals are independence from Saudi Arabia and independence from China with the same deal, which is we produce our own energy, we produce a better standard of living, we produce American jobs, our national security gets better, our economy gets better, and we have the money once we balance the budget to actually pay down the national debt. I mean, that package can be done. My, my request for all of you, you really want to help in a way that pits people power against money power. And I, look, I, I make no bones about this. Governor Romney has the money power. He has every major source on Wall Street. He's raised a huge amount of money from people who give $2,500. We have 170,000, 169,000 donors. 95% of them give less than $250. And we are basically pitting lots of people against Wall Street and Governor Romney. That's what this is going to come down to. And I want to ask you to do two things. Use Facebook, Twitter, email, whatever system you have. Uh, and just send out today that you were here and send out Newt equals $2.50 a gallon gas. Okay. And ask your friends to go to Newt.org and look at the film so that they can see this is a serious, well-thought-out proposal 
that has lots of experts behind it that's real. This is not just a slogan. This is a policy. And then ask them to consider going to newt.org and just giving $25. I'll, I'll let you calculate for yourselves how many times would you have to fill up your car or truck at $250 a gallon to have saved enough to justify a $25 investment? I mean, that's, it's a, you know, and then after you fill it up that number of times, everything after that's pure profit. Uh, but we're going to try to run a campaign where we get millions of people engaged, just as we did with Drill Here, Drill Now, Pay Less, and where we draw a vivid alternative. And, and the message I have, I, I was at Oral Roberts University a couple days ago with 3,500 people, and um, I, I said to the young people there, my real message is things can change. You know, the current mess we're in, it's not an act of God, it's an act of Obama. <laughs> it's not inevitable. It's a byproduct of, of a strange election in 2008. The fact is that you can change these things pretty fast. When Ronald Reagan came in, Jimmy Carter, who, who prior to Obama was the worst president in modern times, <laughs> but, but Obama has saved him from that. Uh, <laughs> Carter, some of, you, some of you will remember, Carter had gasoline rationing. You, you, you bought every other day based on the, the, the last the number of your license plate. A good friend of mine, Dave Bossy at Citizens United, was 13 that year, and he went, uh, his job every morning was to take a screwdriver out back and make sure that the car that needed gasoline had the right license plate. I always tell people, that here's a simple test for whether you're a liberal or a conservative. If I tell you the government has a policy so dumb, we're teaching 13-year-olds how to break it. If you're a conservative, you say we ought to change the policy. If you're a liberal, you say that means we need license plate police at every gas station. <laughs> so Reagan, Reagan comes in. The very first executive order he signs eliminates gasoline rationing, returns gasoline to the free market, and within six months the price has crashed because people go out and start producing. So we can turn things around pretty fast. My prediction is the economy will start to get substantially better late on election night when it's clear that we have defeated Obama. You might ask, so how fast will we ask the new Congress to move? As your nominee, I will campaign this fall with candidates for the House and Senate, asking them to make an absolute commitment that when they go, when they are sworn in on January 3rd, that they will stay in session. And by the time I'm sworn in on January 20th, they will have passed the repeal of Obamacare. Yeah. They will have passed the repeal of the Dodd-Frank bill, which is killing small banks. And they will have passed the repeal of Sarbanes-Oxley, which is crippling our businesses with red tape for no advantage. And on the very first day I'm sworn in, I would like to be able to sign all three of those repeals as part of the opening day. Now, We will also, about two hours after the inaugural address, take some time to sign a series of executive orders. All of them will have been published uh, by October 1st, so everybody will know that if you elect me, this is what's going to happen. The very first executive order will eliminate all of the White House czars as of that moment. The fact is, the second executive order will open up the Keystone Pipeline as of that day. So I'm just asking the Canadians to give us till January 20th and we'll build the pipeline. They do not have to have a, deal, a partnership with China because America would like to be their partner once we have a president who remembers that Canada is our neighbor. We will also sign the Mexico City well, principle of Ronald Reagan, no U.S. tax money will be used overseas to pay for abortion. And I will sign an executive order instructing the State Department to move our embassy to Jerusalem in recognition of Israel's right to exist as a sovereign country. You, 
you can actually go to newt.org and offer up your own ideas uh, for executive orders. We're, we're going to sort through them and by October 1st have them all written. Our goal is by the time Barack Obama lands um, in uh, Chicago, we would like to have repealed about 40% of his government as the opening day. I am confident that we can do this. And I think what makes me different from my other three candidates for the nomination is I've actually done things at a national level. In 1980, I worked with President Reagan, and we developed a program, then Governor Reagan. We developed a program of lower taxes, less regulation, more American energy, and being positive about job creators. And in eight years' time, 16 million new jobs are created. We also had a program for defeating the Soviet Empire, and it was defeated. The fact is, in 1994, when I came back with the campaign with a contract with America, we stood on Reagan's shoulders. We followed very similar models. We reformed welfare, the largest entitlement reform of your lifetime. Two out of three people went to work or went to school, and the quality of life improved for children because their parents were working and they were actively engaged in earning a living, and, their, and the standard of living went up. We passed the first tax cut in 16 years and the largest capital gains tax cut uh, in American history. 11 million new jobs were created in four years. Unemployment dropped to 4.2 percent. As a result, we were able to sign the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, and for four consecutive years, we balanced the federal budget for the only time in your lifetime. Now, you know, these aren't promises, these aren't theories, these aren't talking points written by my consultants. These are, in fact, things we actually did. And I would suggest if you look at the degree to which we changed Washington in a conservative direction and compare it with the degree to which Governor Romney developed Romney Care as a perfect Massachusetts big government solution, the gap is about this wide. And that's how big the difference is. And that's why I need your help. Because the fact is we need a conservative to be running against Barack Obama. We do not need a moderate who will be unable to distinguish himself from President Obama. I want to briefly talk about two other parts of, of this administration. This is the most anti-religious administration in American history. And I believe all of us need to stand up for the First Amendment and the right of people to worship God. Our, and, and I want every American to understand how fundamentally radical Barack Obama is from the American tradition. Our Declaration of Independence says we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that means in America, what makes us an exceptional nation is that in America, power comes from God to each one of you personally. You are personally sovereign. The government does not grant you power. You loan the government power. That's what makes us different. And when it says your rights are unalienable, that means no president, no judge, no bureaucrat can come between you and God. And this administration is acting in a radically un-American way in its efforts to create a secular country which would, in fact, end the American experiment and replace it with a European model in which the president is sovereign and we are merely subjects. Mr. I my message to President Obama is simple. We, the Americans, are not subjects. We are citizens. And we are not going to tolerate this kind of attitude. <laughs> Finally, every American should genuinely be worried. This is the most dangerous administration in national security in our history. The, these folks are delusional about the nature of the world. And their whole approach, we had a Moroccan try to bomb the capital. 
We can all be glad that the FBI stopped him. But this administration refuses to talk about why he wanted to bomb the Capitol. You know, you're not allowed to say radical Islamist. You're not, connect, you're not allowed to connect the attitudes of the Muslim Brotherhood, who, by the way, yesterday announced that Egypt has to become a more Islamic state, which bodes badly for the Coptic Christians who've been there for 2,000 years. I mean, we, we forget. We're up against a worldwide movement that has a very clear sense of its own radicalism that intends to defeat us. They don't, they don't tend to find ways to communicate with us. And, of course, they play our diplomats as fools because they say one thing in English and something very different in Arabic. And this has been going on with the Palestinians, for example, for at least 30 years, where if you, if you talk to them, if you look what they say in Arabic, they say not a single Jew will remain. Well, that's not a complicated concept. I mean, if you want to know why we don't have a peace process that works between Hamas and Israel, it's because Hamas's goal is to destroy Israel. How do you make peace with a neighbor who's firing rockets at you? I mean, if, you had, if, if in the Tri-Cities area you had 11 missiles land in November, do you think you would have said, oh, we need to have a peace conference? <laughs> That's not the American way. And I don't think we should ask the Israelis to risk their lives so that Barack Obama feels better about his desire to somehow communicate with those who want to kill us. They're communicating just fine. When, when, when Ahmadinejad, the head of the Iran, says we can wipe Israel from the face of the earth, I think I know what he means. He means we can wipe Israel from the face of the earth. But none of our elites want to deal with that because it scares them. Because if they took it seriously, they'd have to do something. And they don't want to do anything. They just want to manage the decay and hope no disaster occurs while they're in office. That's a very dangerous attitude. And the fact that this president then wants to cut our defense budget makes it even worse. So I think that this election this fall is extraordinarily important. If you help me get the nomination, and the caucuses here are going to be very important. You are the last big event before Super Tuesday. So you have a huge chance to really help change things. And you have a huge chance to carry our message of 250 a gallon gasoline across the whole state and across the whole country to all of your friends. And you'd be surprised just in this one room how many total contacts you have on, on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere. So you can make a big impact. As your nominee, I want you to know that we will run an American campaign, not a Republican campaign. We're going to say to everyone in the country, if you like 250 a gallon gasoline, we want you to be with us. If you'd rather have 8 or $9 a gallon like Dr. Chu, you ought to be with Obama. We're going to say to everybody in the country, if you like jobs and a paycheck, we want you to be with us. If you prefer food stamps and dependency, you ought to be with Barack Obama. If you believe in the Declaration of Independence and that your rights come from your creator, you ought to be with us. If you believe in Saul Alinsky and we ought to be a European system, you ought to be with Barack Obama. If you think the world has danger and we ought to be strong, we want you to be with us. If you think we're the problem and we just misunderstand the world and therefore weakness will be good, you ought to be with Barack Obama. I believe we can win an enormous victory with your help. But first, we have to get to the nomination. Cliss and I are thrilled that you're here. We're going to come and see you and hope to get, get to shake hands and talk to every one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out today.